Thank you again for joining us at Genius Machines 2020 Virtual Summit. I'm James Hansen, Vice President and Publisher of NextGov, the Federal Technology News and Media Division of Government Executive Media Group. And I'm excited to continue today's conversation on enabling emerging technologies like AI, 5G, and the cloud for government's mission. Joining me today from Cisco are Don Lane. Don is a product specialist for Fluid Mesh, acquired by Cisco, addressing mining, point ports and terminals, and oil and gas. Don has a distinguished background in business improvement through technology, as well as providing wireless connectivity to over 16 autonomous machine environments. Joining Don is Azita Kia. Uh, Azita is a technical solution manager in the Cisco Mobility CTO office. She focuses on next generation wireless technologies, including mobility, 5G, private cellular, and heterogeneous networks working with both enterprise and service provider market se segments. And last but certainly not least, Joe Beal. Joe is Cisco's senior defense strategist. Joe focuses on providing integrated solutions for defense that leverage Cisco's extensive portfolio of IT capabilities and solutions from verticals such as manufacturing, oil and gas, and mining. So thank you all for joining me today. Let's jump into it. Don, we're going to start with you first. When you think about Genius Machines, what is top of mind as far as enabling technology capabilities required for such innovative machines? Well, James, thank you for asking. So there are three points that are, are critical. Um, connectivity, uh, the monitoring and control of the solution, and the data that comes out of the solutions. Um, connectivity, it's a critical piece of any effective machine operation. Um, it is an often overlooked part of the solution. And is taken for granted, um, uh, you know, to be a, such a simple process when it's really not. The machine connectivity generally requires one of all three, one or all three of high throughput, low latency, and fast handoff for for a successfully connected solution. The next piece is monitoring and control. Uh, this becomes even more critical in maintaining these ever growing connected environments. A monitoring solution will provide the insight as to the stability of the network and its ability to sustain the connected machine a critical piece of, of keeping it running. And then the data aspect of it, as the world has increased in connected machines, therefore there's an amount of an increased amount of data that has come along with that. The storage analytics and use of this data is critical in sustaining an AI environment. Uh, we must be in a position to, to, preview, to review, analyze and provide updates to the AI environment in real time or as close to real time as we can possibly obtain, obtain to remain relevant. And the last thing, um, as you mentioned, Fluid Mesh part of Cisco, uh, it's an ideal solution for any moving scenarios for connected machine environments. As a result, the AI uh, is a tremendous benefit, especially at the edge. Fluid Mesh technology has AI machining and its fluidity solution of all radios. Azita. There is a tremendous amount of excitement and perhaps even hype around both 5G and cloud. What makes 5G and cloud particularly useful in advanced machinery, industrial settings, robotics, uh, unmanned systems, and the delivery of AI? Uh, James, uh, yes, there is still a lot of hype with 5G, but it's coming along. So to understand 5G, uh, we really need to look a little bit at the history. So. 3G, well, first and foremost, 5G is the fifth generation of the 3GPP standards group that builds the cellular standards that basically makes all cell phones run. Now, with uh, the third generation, we basically got pervasive voice on cell phones that everybody started to use. With 4G, we got data on the cell phones that made texting pervasive, and everybody is addicted to Twitter these days, right? Now, with 5G, we are going to be able to get even more cellular wireless, more spectrum. These type of intelligent uh, devices that we have created is going to become more pervasive to the extent that we can now apply these technologies to industrial sophisticated use cases, as opposed to very simple voice and text type applications. So that's really the promise of 5G. The way that 5G proposes to do that is enhancements in radio, the new radios that are coming out are going to be much more capable of doing more throughput, lower latency with much lower energy profiles that makes their use easier. Um, they're going to, we are also going, uh, we, the 3GPP standards have also disaggregated the mobile core, the engine that runs all the cellular network. And through disaggregation, we are now able to use cloud and distribute these microservices across the network 
in a distributed manner that would enable scale, flexibility, and enable a lot of innovations that weren't possible before. So that's really putting it very briefly what 5G is bringing to the table. So, Joe, what about uh, edge other than mobile access, edge compute, or MEC? So, James, uh, it's really about distributing compute and your compute architecture from the edge to the cloud. It, it depends on where data is created, where it's used, and where it can make a, bi a business or a mission impact. So, edge may be uh, an industrial switch in a manufacturing environment, and you can run an application critical to that process right there, or it could be multiple machines in a cell, and you're running the application on that industrial switch. An example built into what we deliver is Cisco CyberVision, which runs on uh, the actual switch. The switch has IOX as the operating system and Linux for running a compute application, and that provides cybersecurity capability for industrial systems right there at the industrial environment. So, Zita, pivoting back to you, and uh, follow up for 5G. How does uh, 5G fit into the wireless capabilities? So 5G should be looked at as really one mode of wireless. And um, 3GPP has so far been really dealing with what we call quote unquote macro wireless or cellular networks for mobile phones that are being provided by large MNOs and service providers. There are other modes of wireless, for example, in the enterprises, Wi-Fi that is being defined by the IEEE group is pervasive, that is dominant. And then there are still other wireless modes for IoT and for even uh, smaller, closer distances, like you know, all our cell phones are working with Bluetooth or BLE is another standard that ATIS defines. So all of these groups of wireless have to be really looked at together in order to be able to provide a coherent experience for the end user and to enable the type of applications that Don is talking about to run on top of wireless networks. So in Cisco, what we are um, calling this grouping of multiple wireless uh, heterogeneous networks, and we should really collect wireline in that as well. Our vision is that the future would be uh, providing a network that consists of multiple modalities. It can be wireline, wireless, different protocols, different speeds, different latency requirements, but it would all be wrapped together in a, a framework with uniform security and policy and management to enable upper layer applications to use those network services with ease. And all of those services would be possible to be laid out either at the edge or in a centralized cloud uh, on a personal device or very many different types of configurations that we can't even think about right now. So HetNet is how we are thinking of new mode of better wireless going forward. And, and Don, can you provide an a AI use case, an example of, of how this is relevant for defense? Of course. So as, as Azita mentioned, uh, HetNet um, is, you know, heterogeneous networks of several modalities and fluid mesh is one of those modalities and a part of that HetNet solution. And, and fluid mesh can, can provide coverage uh, for any moving type vehicle, whether it be trains or trucks or cranes, um, planes, I mean, all kinds of different things. And one of the examples is, is a project that we worked on not too long ago, uh, a remote control technology solution at a decommissioned military base in New Mexico. Uh, the base was previously used for explosive testing. Um, so the objective was to clear out the, un the base for unexploded ordinances. Previous to this, they were sending people out into the field in a machine uh, operating these, these, um, these machines to remove these ordinances in the hopes that None of them would explode. So you want to take the, the people out of it, have a zero entry opportunity to have a safety, a more, a more safety uh, you know, oriented solution. So the connection was to provide uh, remote connectivity to these, to these equipment to remove these ordinances, uh, thus therefore making the land safe for future development. Uh, the big challenge was to deliver a robust wireless connection to those vehicles operating over the tele-remote solution in fluid mesh is part of HetNet was able to do such. 
You definitely see the uh, the relevance there. Uh, Joe, given your work uh, with DOD, can you give a uh, example of uh, how that can be applied? Uh, and then maybe also talk a little bit about how you would recommend DOD uh, handling cybersecurity in this type of environment. Absolutely. So the example that Don gave, you can easily see how that could be applied to a naval shipyard or an ammunition depot. So in shipyards, they've had several fires, hundreds of millions of dollars of damage, putting people's lives at risk. You can easily take augmented reality, enhance that firewatch's uh, ability to see if the hot work, the cutting, grinding, welding is exceeding the authorized parameters and help prevent those fires. In, in an ammunition depot, you could take a robotic machine and replace the human in measuring, pouring, and mixing explosives, take them out of that uh, dangerous situation. And these are operations that are critical to generating readiness for our military forces. So they're, they're key to be secured to protect their efficiency, make sure we do things properly. So I would highly recommend a zero trust architecture approach for cybersecurity. And when things are absolutely classified or very sensitive, you want to protect them, you can use the National Security Agency's commercial solutions for classified program to protect them using two layers of commercial encryption to provide a type one equivalent. And, and I think that uh, DOD is is definitely heading in, in that direction. Uh, so shifting gears just slightly, Azita, uh, we all know cell phones and tablets are indispensable because of the apps and data we get access to when and where we need them. Uh, how is that spread to other application developers? Well, the how is going to be very complex. We can't go over the how here, but imagine the cell phone evolution as sort of a vision statement of where we want to take all wireless applications. And if those wireless applications tend to be, you know, remote experts with sophisticated goggles or uh, equipment that we can't even imagine right now, imagine all of those to be as easy to use as your cell phone, as easy to manage in terms of the lifecycle management, you know, updating software pieces or changing parts, uh, maintaining, securing as your cell phone, that is really the direction that everything is going. And let's just leave it at that. The how is yet to be fully imagined, but there are various tools in our toolbox that we are starting to use in order to enable that type of a sophisticated, very highly automated and easy to use set of tools in industrial space. No, thank you for that. And, and thank you for this conversation. This is fantastic. There is a lot of good stuff here. Uh, but Joe, we're, as we wrap up, can you give us, um, leave our audience one, one or two, two or three uh, takeaways? Yeah, absolutely, James. So I would summarize this conversation and the things that Don and Azita and I talked about in three things, connectivity, a distributed compute architecture, and zero trust security for cybersecurity. Uh, the connectivity is absolutely critical, a heterogeneous networking environment that gets the connectivity to where the data is created, where the application is run, connecting the people, the machines, and the processes, and enabling you to do that monitoring and control and that feedback to make sure your network is aligned to your operations and you're getting the data out and using it. The distributed compute is really important. You can enable microservices right at the location where data is created or the application is performed. You can use the cloud where data aggregation may be more important or you're looking at things over a long period of time. And you can bring AI to bear uh, across that distributed compute spectrum. DOD is doing it today. That's going to continue to grow. That intelligence in our operations is absolutely critical. And then zero trust. You, you've lost the perimeter. Uh, identity is that new perimeter. It spans from the edge to the cloud. So it's critical to have a zero trust architecture, role-based access, layered security, that goes from the edge to the cloud. And, and so it's important to think about that as you build this architecture, build your zero trust security architecture with it. Thank you, Joe. Uh, and thank you, Don and Azita. Uh, great conversation. Um, thank you to Cisco for supporting today's event. And thank you, our audience, for joining us. Please stay tuned for our next session. I think you'll hear a lot about what Joe, Don, and Azita have discussed and how that can be applied to joint domain operations.